Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar of today, 4th of June 2020. We will be discussing OT security risk today, uh, how to assess and address. Who are we? My name is Mentor Emerlai. Uh, I'm a consultant at Secura. Uh, I have experience in IT and OT audits in line with standards such as IEC 62443 and ISO 27001. Uh, I have performed various site assessments internationally uh, and my strength lie in IoT and OT security standardization and certification. Uh, I also have a keen interest in applying standards in practice um, uh, for organizations and clients. I'll give the word now to you, Andre, for your introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Mentor. My name is Andre Slingerland. I'm a senior consultant at Secura. And I have a background of over 20 years in uh, cybersecurity, forensics, ICS, automotive, incident response, security architecture, compliance, etc. Well, about Secura. Secura has been active for 20 years in security testing. Um, uh, we as Secura believe in approaching security from a holistic point of view. We work in the areas of people, processes, and technology. Uh, for our customers, we offer a range of security testing services varying in depth and scope. Uh, we provide security advice, testing, training, and certification services, and cover all aspects such as people, policies, organizational processes, network systems, applications, and data. Specifically for OT, uh, we consider the following services as quite relevant or IT OT risk assessment, uh, or secure development lifecycle approach, uh, or threat modeling and design review services, uh, or security awareness program safe, red teaming in OT and IT, and our ICS security training course. The agenda of today, uh, we will start with a short introduction uh, of OT and ICS security. Uh, what is happening there? What do we see there? and what can happen to you as an organization. Then we will go on with uh, why should I care as an organization? Due diligence and regulatory requirements are very important there. From there, we will continue with what is my risk profile as an organization? And there we will share uh, the Secura OT risk assessment methodology and how we perform OT risk assessments. Last but not least, we will continue with the lessons learned uh, from our recent OT assessments. Uh, uh, what do we see there and what uh, benefit can that be for you? Then now I give the word back to my colleague Andre to start with the introduction in OT and ICS security. Yes, thank you, uh, Mentor, for the introduction. So let's start with a brief recap on industrial control systems, operational technology, and its potential security issues. As we all know, industrial control systems are built on OT, operational technology. They are the control systems that drive electric power generation and distribution, the oil and gas industry, wastewater treatment, drinking water distribution, and overall water management, and also manufacturing industry. We can also find them in infrastructure operations such as dam, bridges, mining, transportation, as well as building or marine automation. So in the next picture, we have a simplified schematic of a typical modern day ICS network. Here it is important to note that multiple plant net networks can also be connected to a site network, which in its turn can also be connected to multiple site networks, connecting to the office network for production planning and logistics. But for the sake of simplicity and time, we will not go deeper into this at this point. Just remember that the real world is usually much more complex. At the low level, we have our control devices and instrumentation such as valves, pumps, actuators and centers. And above it is the distributed control systems and PLCs governing the control loop. Again, for the sake of simplicity, we, we do not distinguish between the various industry verticals and ICS deployment scenarios. On a higher level, we find the so-called supervisory control and data acquisition or SCADA systems. They are typically used to monitor and control the operational process from a higher level, 
such as the overall process of plant, site or distribution network. They allow for the unattended operation of on-site or remote systems, such as power stations, wellheads, pumping units, pipelines and so on, by gathering data from remote sensors and remotely adjusting the systems that would otherwise require human intervention. Now let's have, have a look at the differences in, between IT versus OT. According to Gartner's IT glossary, IT is the common term for the entire spectrum of technologies for information processing. It also states that in general, IT does not include embedded technologies that do not generate data for enterprise use. Whereas operational technology is defined by Gartner as hardware and software that detects or causes a change through the direct monitoring and or control of industrial equipment, assets, processes and events. But in real life, OT and IT systems are used to gather information used more or less directly in enterprise planning and calculation. And IT systems in, in their turn generate output data which is used to only more drive a production or distribution process. So those IT and OT worlds are converging as illustrated on the next slide. So both IT and OT may work together to control a larger physical process. But historically, there was a traditional divide to take into account between different technology, IT information technology, and operational technology. As these domains utilize different technologies and have very different mindsets and associated skill sets. So from a risk perspective, in traditional IT, the focus is usually on confidentiality, integrity, and availability in that order, as illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide. But for IoT, however, the primary focus usually lies on physical safety and the continuity of the operational process. So let's have a look at what can happen and has actually happened in the past. Let's start with some well-known incidents. Already back in the year 2000, in Maroochydore, Australia, a guy called Vitek Bowden made at least six, 46 attempts to control the sewage system during March and April. This he did after he was rejected from a job application. At the time, he was employed by the company that had installed the system. At some point, the attack caused millions of liters of raw sewage to spill out into local parks, rivers, and even the grounds of a hotel. On the 23rd of April, the date of his last hacking attempt, police pulled him over and found radio and computer equipment in his car. A later investigation found that his laptop and the radio had been used at the time of the attacks and that his hard drive contained software for accessing and controlling the sewage management system. He was convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. So then in 2010, as we all know, Stuxnet happened. This was really a watershed moment demonstrating again that cyber physical attacks were possible and occurring. And within a few years of Stuxnet, OT reconnectivity started popping up all over the world. So next, in 2015 and 2016, Attackers were able to disable the Ukraine power grid for a large part by remotely attacking the power grid network. And of course, in 2017, malicious outsiders attacked a chemical processing plant in Saudi Arabia and uh, sabotaged the industrial control systems network. It's also important to distinguish between inten intentional and accidental incidents. Because recently, in the beginning of this year, it was unveiled that a cyber attack actor used a spear phishing link to obtain initial access to a US gas pipeline operator. The threat actor, actor then deployed commodity ransomware on both networks, IT and OT. This resulted in a loss of availability of control systems and partial loss of view of the operational processing, forcing the operator to initiate a controlled shutdown. It is especially worth noting that the emergency response plan did not specifically consider cyber attacks. It took them at least two days to recover from this. 
And according to the ICS security firm Zagros, there is no available evidence that the adversary specifically targeted OT operations. It was just a typical ransomware behavior and not ICS specific or, or an ICS targeted event. Also, from all these incidents, there is one major conclusion. Once again, there is no air gap. In Maruchidor, even though the system was designed as a standalone system, communications between pumping stations and the central computer were by means of, of a dedicated analog to a radio system operating through repeater stations. And Mr. Bowden had the knowledge and the tools to do this. In Stuxnet, there was an air gap, all right, but it was compromised via sneakernet. Once again, evidence that an air gap is just an extremely high latency network. In Black Energy, Industroyer and Triton, all exploited, readily available and ineffectively protected network connections, pivoting from external red networks right into the ICS OT domain. So as a side note, already back in 1995, I myself was connecting production control systems to office plant systems via token ring with absolutely no network security measures whatsoever. So yes, I plead guilty. So next up, why should I care? Why should I do anything about this? Um, well, of course, we want that to prevent bad things from happening because we think it is important to secure our network and the continuity of our operation because the board and the CEO and the holding company or the shareholders want us to protect the company against bad things from happening. But there is also the possibility of regulatory requirements. You have to do something about OT security because it's required by law. In the European Union, we have the NIST directive, which is implemented in the WBNI law in the Netherlands, or because it's compulsory in our sector. For instance, for the banking industry, there are a lot of rules and regulations to which they have to adhere, such as PCI, DSS, SOX, etc. The NIST directive is, is, is unclear as to what you should do about security. It only states that you have to prevent yourself using the internationally um, internationally accepted uh, standards and good practices. So it basically says, choose your own standards and choose wisely. Yes, ICS and OT security standards. Well, as we have said earlier, ICS are responsible for controlling and monitoring a wide range of different types of physical and mostly critical processes. Uh, the failure of such systems can have severe effects, both economical and environmental. But how do you organize that everybody in the industry is protected to a certain extent? Well, this is where ICS standards come into play. As standards are considered a strong tool for security, um, which provide validated guidance, a structured approach and metrics to measure security. There are a few standards that focus specifically on ICS security. However, many industry segments, uh, there are certain laws regulating how this protection must be implemented. For example, uh, plants delivering power to the North American power grid are required to fulfill the NERC SIP standard. Operators of essential services in the Netherlands need to comply to the NIS WBNE requirements. And in the Emirates, for instance, the NASA standard is currently in development and is expected to be published soon. Other examples of standards and best practices are the NIST 800-82 Guide to Industrial Control Systems ICS Security or the NIST Cybersecurity Framework and IEC 62443. The NIST guidelines, for example, have a very detailed description on what security controls should be used and considered for ICS. The NIST cybersecurity framework, on the other hand, uh, was developed specifically for in critical infrastructure organizations, but can also be applied to any other sector as it is very generic. Well, at Secura, we focus uh, on the IEC 62443 standard for ICS and OT. 
um, according to many, the standard has the right focus on the main objectives, which are continuity and safety. Uh, the standard is also considered one of the most mature standards for ICS. One of its biggest advantages is uh, the fact that it provides a holistic approach on the security of the whole ICS domain. Uh, that's why the standard is considered also the, the de facto standard for cybersecurity and industrial control systems, as, is the, as this is the only one being applied internationally and cross industry. Um, 62443 is widely used by industries and also uh, forms a base for certification. For example, the Embedded Device Security Assurance Certification. Uh, 62443 might be the most complete and mature, but it also has many commonalities with other publications and can be um, met relatively easy for you as an organization. I'm not going into much explanatory depth of the standard itself. Um, however, I will give a high-level description of the standard and what it withholds, what it requires, and last but not least, how risk assessments fit therein. IEC 62443 consists of a number of documents describing different aspects of implementing, maintaining security uh, to a well-defined level within an uh, ICS. The standard is split into four main groups with several documents uh, within each group. So uh, 62443-1-X contains general documents for defining concepts, terminology, use cases, uh, etc. 2-X contains policies and procedures and contains, for instance, secure patch management and security program requirements. 3-X contains system level uh, requirements and risk assessments. 4-X contains component level requirements, including component development requirements. Uh, the standard in general provides requirements that must be fulfilled, but does not suggest measures for evaluating implementation of the same requirements. Uh, so there is no clear guideline that says how, ca how you can assure that requirements are met. Uh, so that makes uh, assigning levels of security and countermeasures into uh, mostly subjective tests for an implementing organization. Um, this does not mean necessarily that uh, um, uh, that is, is negative, uh, as especially this characteristic makes the standard useful also uh, when new technologies uh, are introduced. So a cybersecurity management system, as per 62443, 2-1, uh, uh, typically should include a programs to continu continuously assess risk to ICS. This is also where later the uh, secure OT risk assessment comes into play. Um, within an, uh, a cybersecurity management system, security levels are created to classify groups of assets with regards to security zones. So for each security zone, a target security level is assigned. The security level is usually the outcome of a risk assessment that is, per that is performed of a particular zone. Um, in this example, uh, it, can be, it can be also seen that the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, a risk assessment is found as the basis uh, for a cybersecurity management system. Well, this shows that even though there are differences, there are also commonalities between the various standards and best practices, for example, with IEC 62443. Well, the question is then, what is my risk profile and how do you assess risk in OT environments and why would you want to do so in the first place? Well, generally speaking, availability and safety are always key. You might want to know, for instance, if your production processes are secure, and what could happen to them and what threats you are facing and are protected from. Questions that come to mind could be, uh, could manipulation cause physical damage to the site or employees? What happens when there's an uncontrolled shutdown? What in the first place could cause such a shutdown? And then you can know how well current capabilities help in preventing, detecting, or responding to threat. Well, again, uh, such risk assessment could uh, be a part of your uh, cybersecurity management system, but can also be performed when you, when you do not have that uh, in place yet. A risk assessment can be performed in various ways. However, we think 
that such assessment should always adhere to best practices. Well, now I'm going to tell you more about how Secura deals with performing OT risk assessments and the methodology that uh, we follow in doing so. Well, the OT risk assessment focuses on um, site level risk as opposed to organizational level risk. Uh, the risk assessment zooms uh, specifically on critical subsystems or networks on a particular site, uh, thereby a comprehensive comprehensive view is out of scope as this is mostly uh, not feasible in practice. Moreover, the risk assessment can be seen as an, uh, a snapshot of your security at a given moment of time. Um, uh, in our approach, 62443 is leading uh, with uh, the support of the NIST guidelines and uh, the ALARP principles. So how can IEC 62443 help? Uh, well, for example, for identification and authentication control, uh, the extent of insider risk is assessed, focusing on the impact that can be caused per, uh, per group of insiders based on the existing mitigating controls of your organization. Then uh, external exposure of the site is uh, investigated in the form of uh, undesirable externally accessible domains, such as uh, IPs, modem connectivity, as well as physical security vulnerabilities of the entire site, which could impact the availability and safety of the site. Uh, OT network traffic analysis is uh, assessed to discover various kinds of connectivity present on site, exposure outside of designated areas and physical parameters, and any security issues that can be identified passively. Uh, the cyber resilience is assessed on both an architectural and configuration level and uh, um, data exfiltration risk uh, are assessed seeing if it is possible to obtain, uh, for example, uh, intellectual property, uh, optical proper secrets uh, or technical information to uh, prepare sabotage. Well, network design and traffic analysis uh, is performed uh, at uh, agreed upon locations using passive network taps or monitor ports. Uh, thereby, it's important to not uh, perform active scanning, man in the middle, or any other measures which might interfere uh, uh, with traffic. OT network and system security is assessed. Uh, well, it's aimed to see if malicious entities can get into your OT network and see what they uh, potentially can compromise. Uh, and we do this by uh, checking firewall configuration, uh, lateral movement, and checking for insecure protocols. Uh, last but not least, a very important uh, part is uh, performing a discrepancy anal analysis uh, between asset inventory, architecture maps, and parameter uh, to see uh, whether ICS visibility and control uh, is appropriate. Well, our uh, methodology that we follow therein, uh, uh, we conduct interviews, uh, uh, for example, with site managers, process owners, uh, engineers, IT and OT operations, uh, but also security personnel to learn more about processes, systems, assets, uh, uh, your concerns, worst case scenarios. Uh, we also perform uh, walkdowns for units of concern or interest. Uh, this consists out of an area or system-based inspection. Um, and this inspection can be visual, like do we see something abnormal? It can be verbal, where uh, we ask questions to the persons uh, walking with us, and they can be technical. We also analyze initial input evidence um, to produce analysis and uh, findings uh, on some core areas. Well, by utilizing the methods on the subject areas, um, observations are identified uh, with each a given risk rating, uh, description of the risk and recommendation according to the ALARP principle. Well, this results in a graphical overview where risks are linked to IEC 62443 foundational requirements, as you can see on the graphical overview here. Uh, and uh, in addition to the risk, we provide, uh, we try to formulate cyber physical attack scenarios 
um, they are outlined by giving a detailed description, which could include all relevant parts of each foundational requirement of IEC 62443. Uh, um, by providing the scenarios, we, pro we aim to provide insight in how effective implemented OT security measures are, as the scenarios aim to explain uh, the way your plant, your site, your people or technology can be targeted by cyber, cyber criminals or even nation state actors. Then now uh, I will give back the word to you, Andre, to continue with the lessons uh, learned. Thanks a lot, uh, Mentor. So as Mentor said, let's move on to some actual outcomes uh, of our past OT risk assessments. Um, number one of, on our list is, of course, as to be expected, the insecure design of OT systems and protocols. Major vendors of ICS equipment re repeatedly made the same mistakes or do not even consider IT security related in their development process. It has been improving for some years already, but given the fact that most OT equipment has a typical deployment life cycle of 10 years or more, this will not easily nor quickly fade out, so to speak. Also, of course, we see the use of outdated regular IT protocols, for instance, SNMP version 1, for instance. Of course, this poses risks that are very challenging to mitigate, but one could start with protecting assets by means of segmentation. This implies defining and protecting clear zones and boundaries, both inter and intra ICS networks at the various levels. Additionally, network monitoring at both the connection and protocol level is an effective measure here. Here are some examples of vulnerabilities in industrial control systems. So next, exposure of vulnerable systems at the next network level is to be expected. We come, we come across a lot of unpatched or ancient systems such as Windows 2003 server, Windows XP engineering and operator workstations, Network devices, switches, etc., running very old and vulnerable operating systems such as old Linux kernels. We also come across systems with hard coded passwords, etc., etc. But this is not our main cause for concern. All the systems are a fact of life. They are there, they're not going away. We need to different approaches to protect these. So, once again, segmentation, both at vert vertical and horizontal level, that is both inter and intra ICS network. One could consider virtual patching, that is, filter out network traffic containing known exploits. And of course, monitoring. Because as it is, living off the land and using what is in place and send out your own control messages is all an attacker needs once inside your ICS network. You don't need to actually exploit any vulnerability in any system once you have access to the target network. And that is why segmentation is so important. It makes it harder to access those targeted systems and detect any anomalies on the networks, both inside the given zone as well as on the network perimeters. Next, of course, we come across a lack of asset and patch management. Often, more often than not, there is no central configuration management database. This leads to a lack of visibility into what's actually out there in your ICS network and what patch levels are deployed on systems. And sometimes systems are replaced by other equipment, but they're not even removed from the network. So one of our recommendations usually is create and maintain an asset inventory. As I already said in our recommendations, monitoring is important. Visibility is important. But more often than not, this is also not sufficiently done. When network maps are outdated, documentation is not updated and an asset inventory is not present or properly maintained, an organization loses static visibility. In terms of dynamic visibility, more often than not, no form of ICS network monitoring is in place on Purdue level three and lower. That is, in the entire ICS network beyond the boundary with regular enterprise IT. And if there is a network more monitor, more often than not, it is IT technology with absolutely no knowledge of OT protocols. So basically, it's also blind to what is there and it doesn't know where to find it. So in addition to creating static visibility, knowing what's in your network, we would also like to know what's going on, which implies network monitoring. As I already said, it is important 
to segment your network. There are two main reasons for not having effective segmentation. The first reason is the general lack of segmentation on the network perimeters. For instance, there is no firewall at all between network zones and boundaries, or there are, if there isn't a firewall, there are any-to-any -any rules or many-to-many -many rules effectively disabling your network perimeter protection. And another reason for in inefficient network segmentations is the fact that we come across connections that are not directly visible because they're not in the design, such as a rogue Wi-Fi access point or a supplier's remote maintenance 4G Wi-Fi router with direct internet access in, in a plant network, basically overruling your perimeter protection. And one special case of a lack of segmentation is for safety instrumented systems. Sometimes we, we even found safety instrumented systems that were directly connected to the rest of the plant network, exposing them to all kinds of potential manipulation. Remember Triton? There the SIS was exposed and in an undesirable state, the programming key was left on. And we even found an SIS system that was separated from the rest of the ICS using an OT firewall, but the firewall was poorly configured. All Modbus codes were permitted, so no effective filtering was in place. And given the fact that Modbus is an inherently insecure protocol that can be easily spoofed, forged, or replayed, the SIS was in fact completely unprotected. In this specific case, an attacker with access to the OT network could possibly trigger a complete plant shutdown. As Mentor already mentioned, from a security perspective, Security management is very important, but at the basis of security management, you need to perform a risk analysis. And we often see that organizations in the OT world perform physical risk analysis, that is process hazard analysis, on which they base their physical protection measures, but they do not perform a cyber process hazard analysis. A cyber process hazard analysis is a detailed cybersecurity risk assessment methodology that once again conforms to MENTOR's ISA 62443 standard. And the name was given to this method because it is similar to the regular physical process hazards analysis or HAZOP methodology that you sometimes come across. This is important to do because it establishes a formal process to address cyber-related risks to the OT environment in addition to your physical process risk management. And number nine, something that we unsurprisingly come across as well, we come across systems with local accounts, we have unnamed accounts, we have shared accounts and passwords, and even if there is some form of account provisioning, it's often done ad hoc, so not according to any enterprise standard of any kind. There's also after the gap in responsibility, who's responsible for maintaining user accounts? For instance, when a supplier maintains the system remotely and he's the only one with the knowledge of accounts and passwords, quite, quite often these passwords are also the same across different customers for ease of remote maintenance. So it's important to, to identify and manage all user and system accounts in the entire ICS network. And last but not least, also not surprisingly, we we find that cybersecurity awareness is often very low because um, the behavior of people is not in line with the criticality of the systems that they operate. And the general idea behind this is that to people, sometimes cybersecurity is a hampering factor. So why should you not download an update on your own laptop and subsequently connect it to the control systems? What is so special about that operator password anyway? Nobody else has physical access to the system. We at Secura think that OT cybersecurity awareness is just as important as physical safety awareness. So to summarize it, how can we address those risks? Well, first of all, perform a risk analysis. Set up your risk treatment procedures. Do you know your own risk appetite from a cyber perspective? Next up, select proper standards and frameworks in order to be able to measure your actual security posture. Number three, review all documentation and architecture for completeness and validity 
identify all your assets and maintain an inventory. Implement proper identity and access management. That is, set up user accounts according to uh, specified standards. Monitor your networks and assets. Baseline in common behavior and alert and investigating on in anomalies. That also implies you need to prepare for cyber incident response. Remember the gas pipeline? For Maersk, not Petya brought down the entire Maersk operation. Next up, increase cybersecurity awareness among all personnel operating and working at OT and ICS sites. And finally, in order to be able to measure your posture, measure your posture. From a NIST directive, this is even mandatory. You have to be able to prove what your security posture is towards the national competent authority. And of course, we at Secura can help you with all of this. Well, the OT security assessment. Well, today we discussed the uh, OT risk assessment. Uh, uh, we have another up and coming OT webinar, and that is regarding OT in red teaming. And that is on the 18th of uh, June, 2020. So if you're interested to join that webinar, uh, then please sign up by uh, uh, going to our website uh, and signing up. Well, let's move on to the questions uh, and answers. Well, the first question is um, regarding initial input evidence uh, during risk assessment, Andre. Um, how do we do that? Is that used using monitoring tools or how is this done? Um, from an assessment perspective, we also we always uh, ask the customer for uh, any documentation of the uh, setup of their OT environment, of their ICS environment, connection to the enterprise network. So that's basically design documentation. Um, we also uh, ask them for their uh, security documentation. Do we have security process in place? Do we have a risk analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we also conduct uh, interviews because in many cases, we find that there is knowledge inside the organization that is not very well maintained and documented, but it is available in the heads of the people actually maintaining and operating the sites. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is about uh, uh, how long does a risk assessment take uh, and how does it work in practice? Um, an OT security risk assessment can take anywhere between uh, half a day for a very small site with a very small network that can be easily seen and inspected up to uh, multiple days for larger uh, plants with uh, multiple plants on one side uh, with, uh, within an organization that has multiple sites. So basically we focus on a single site at what, what, one given time, at any given time. Um, but timelines have to be defined in close cooperation with the customer. Okay, and could you give an, uh, an interesting example of a cyber threat? that you have experienced in practice at a customer, for example? Um, yeah, well, like I said, uh, we often come across uh, um, um, stuff like rogue Wi-Fi access points, um, uh, which are clearly uh, not supposed to be in the network. Um, we also come across um, um, a malware in, uh, in OT networks that uh, is there, remains undetected, like a botnet, uh, for instance. So yes, uh, we do come across uh, examples of that. Do you also use their uh, industry reports coming from the market about incidents, for example? Of course, we follow all the main cybersecurity OT companies. Uh, I mentioned Dragos before, but uh, of course, uh, people like Mandiant also uh, report on OT security. And how do you deal with uh, uh, a risk assessment on, for example, buildings? Oh, to us, a building is just a site, like any other OT network. So we approach it from the same perspective. What can be done from the outside? Can we connect to the network? Uh, mm. 
can 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 we control the uh, the system inside the, the building uh, automation network because uh, more often than not uh, bugnet protocols are used which are also easily manipulated and spoofed um, so what we have actually done in the past for example is gain access to an IT network of an organization by means of connecting to cameras that were on poles outside of uh, the building connecting to the building network. Okay, and going back to the OT network traffic analysis, how do you uh, approach that? Um, we never ever connect our own equipment to a customer's uh, OT network because of the potential risk involved. Um, we always ask the uh, uh, local staff, local engineers to perform a network uh, packet capture for us using a span port on uh, one of their switches from which they know they can be used and uh, from that we collect uh, basically a day worth of network traffic on an OT uh, environment um, which you then of course need to analyze we do traffic analysis in terms of uh, uh, which systems are talking to which other systems? Uh, can we see cross-boundary traffic that is not supposed to be there? Uh, can we see funny stuff like uh, outgoing uh, SMP connections, SMTP? Uh, can we see unprotected network protocols that could be protected? Uh, do we feel that systems are on a given network that there should not be there at all? Because, uh, like I said, uh, because broadcast traffic is coming in, because the firewall is poorly configured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, basically, we just use Wireshark to analyze this, because Wireshark has its own OT uh, protocol dissectors as well. Okay, and what if a if a, a, a customer has multiple plans? How do you deal that uh, with that in performing the risk assessment? Um, like I already said, we perform. Uh, a risk assessment per plant or per site. Um, it, it, it usually depends upon the analysis of the customer's network and architecture to, to, to see if we can deal with a complete site with multiple plants at once or uh, we should focus on uh, uh, sample plants because the rest uh, of them are um, comparable to, to the other plants. Uh, so it all depends on the, uh, on the layout of the uh, customer's network. Okay, and when we perform a risk assessment, uh, do we use IEC 62443 controls for auditing? And can it also be mapped to the uh, to the BO? Um, oh yes, that's a good uh, that's a good question. The BO is a, a Dutch uh, local um, regulation which is uh, mandatory for government organizations. If that's the same BO that we're talking about, I think. Um, and the BO is basically uh, the ISO 27000 uh, uh, standard. Um, so in addition to using IEC 62443 for uh, assessing OT uh, security, uh, once again, it's not an audit, it's an assessment. Um, but that can be used very specifically to augment to the BO in order to be able to demonstrate to the national competent authority that you as an organization are in control of your IT and OT network security because the BO also applies to the OT environment, but it has some controls that are not specific to OT. And whereas IEC 62443 has some controls that are not present in BO, yeah. but should be or could be um, considered uh, required from a NIS or WBNI perspective. Yes. And what if a customer has uh, property devices and uh, how are they checked uh, to see the status, for example, a software update? Proprietary devices in terms of something that the customers themselves have developed, then, well, usually there is design documentation, if I'm not mistaken. So we can, uh, from an assessment perspective, analyze the design of uh, the devices and see if the protocol implementations are up to par with the design. Um, but another thing that we can do is we can go deeper into the devices themselves if they are proprietary and have our colleagues of the certification and testing departments uh, check them out, uh, uh, perform pen testing on your proprietary uh, equipment. That's all a possibility. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of questions left, but uh, 
uh, we will answer them on our website. Thank you for attending. Uh, the link to the recording and the question and answer uh, will be emailed to you. Keep a good eye on the SCURA website for other webinars, uh, training courses and other services. Um, and have a good day and uh, until soon.